So, so let's start. Um, I always love learning about people's acupuncture story um, and what brought them to acupuncture. So I'm going to give you a slightly long version. Speak as long as you want. <laughs> it starts with, it's got a lot to do with when I was born and what was going on when I was a young teenager. Mm -hmm. So it was coincided with the, uh, the beat generation um, with a fascination in, in culture or in the counterculture with um, the mystic East. Um, some of the beats, particularly Gary Snyder, were very much into Zen Buddhism. And, and it was just Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. Um, yoga was hip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it was kind of strong influence on... Um, what was then the budding counterculture. Mm -hmm. So that kind of sowed the seeds. Mm -hmm. Then um, I was a bright kid. I was fast-tracked through school to, uh, especially to get a place in Oxford or Cambridge University. That was going to be kudos for the school and the number of people they could get in. So I, you know, I did, I played that game and I got into Oxford University to study uh, politics, philosophy, and economics mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. Balliol College. And if you know the British scene, no. that particular degree is the basis of lots of people in government, lots of people in the high echelons of the establishment, the press, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I got the place, and then this big thing inside me rebelled. So, <laughs> Side. I'm not, that's just not me, I can't do it. So I, um, I got a place at what was supposedly a, a more hip university. Um, but by that time, by the time I went, it was 1966, mm -hmm. I started dropping acid. Mm -hmm. I started smoking a lot of weed. Um, I started listening to a lot of music. Mm -hmm. Rock and roll and, or something? <laughs> uh, not rock and roll, more... Well, you know, post rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of Dylan, a lot of American West Coast music. Mm -hmm. And sitting in stuffy university rooms studying 16th century English poetry just didn't work for me. I did no work. I got thrown out. You did? <laughs> so I got thrown out, yeah. I was actually told I was the worst student ever to attend the university. <laughs> For a while, well, what an honorary point. title! That's like getting exactly. knighted. <laughs> yeah. So then I went traveling. I did loads of hitching around Europe, North Africa, living on beaches, frolicking with other hippies, mm -hmm. um, with flowers in our hair and such <laughs> like. Still taking quite large quantities of drugs, but underneath it all, because I was brought up by a. Uh, a Jewish mother and a sort of Protestant background father. They were both communists as well. There was this, I was sort of, I imbibed this idea that you have to do something important with your life. Mm -hmm. You have to contribute to society. But with all this kind of cultural influence I had received, mm -hmm. um, all the things that people did, most people did, simply didn't appeal to me. Mm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, I was mm -hmm. constantly going through things, realizing what I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And waiting, waiting for some illumination about what I did want to do. Mm -hmm. And th that finally came after I got sick. I ended up mm. in a tiny Moroccan village with a terrible case of hepatitis. And oh. I actually thought I was going to die there. Wow. And... Whilst I was sick, um, lying on what sometimes seemed my deathbed, um, came across a book. Somebody gave me a book, which was called Zen Macrobiotics, and it was by a Japanese guy called George Asawa, and it was about how diet can change your life and change your health, mm. and natural food, whole grain, loads of vegetables, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And 
it kind of set off a light bulb in me. I knew I had to do something to put myself back together again yeah. after all this degenerate but very enjoyable living. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went back to the UK and I started getting deeply into diet. And then I decided to open a restaurant. Mm. I met a friend, so we opened a macrobiotic restaurant at the university I'd been kicked out of. <laughs> we, I love that. <laughs> we knew nothing about cooking, absolutely nothing. We knew nothing about business. No need. Nothing at all. <laughs> we just did it. That's how you learn, right? First day we opened, 300 people turned up. Oh, for my us. gosh. So, 300 so people? We, yeah, students, because it was cheap. <laughs> It was hip, um, you know, and people were already a little bit interested in uh, alternative diet things. Wow. So we turned out tons over the next year or two. We turned out, turned out there and at numerous festivals that we did, we turned out tons of brown rice and vegetables and stuff. Wow. And that kind of flowed pretty seamlessly into opening a shop, a natural food business called Infinity Foods. Mm hmm uh, which started absolutely tiny with two or three customers a day um, and grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, it's now um, a thriving co-op with about 150 members um, distributing food all over Britain. Wow. Um, but as, the, as, as I carried on doing that, I mean, I, that was my first real complete and utter passion. Mm. You know, I worked 20 hours a day and I loved it. Mm. Finally, I was doing something that I really believed mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to learn everything. I learned plumbing and electrical wiring and building shells and how to write leaflets and how to print leaflets mm -hmm. and how to run a business and all kinds of things. But eventually I got bored with that. But the macrobiotic movement, um, because it originated in Japan and was connected to traditional Japanese practices like shiatsu, mm -hmm. it kind of incorporated a bit of what you might call Eastern medicine. Interesting. Far Eastern medicine. I didn't know that. So that's I, where the macrobiotic oh, stuff. I had oh, no yeah. idea. Yeah. So, you know, we were learning a little bit of this is an acupuncture point and here's the bladder meridian and stuff like that. Ah. And um, I reached a point of crisis. I'm a big fan of crises in life. I had a crisis. I finally reached a point I didn't want to carry on what I was doing, mm -hmm. just running a food business. Mm -hmm. But I didn't yet know what I wanted to do. And I kind of struggled with that. It sort of fermented inside me, mm -hmm. built up pressure not really enjoy it wasn't enjoyable um and then one day bang a light another light bulb went off in my head i'm going to be an acupuncturist i love it so, that, so that's the long answer <laughs> i love it <laughs> to how i started to be an acupuncturist but and it's also so fascinating because you're such an entrepreneur you know and you just you followed your passions and you just went for it and you learned along the way and also you know you're not afraid of switching it up you know, and, and being okay with not wanting to do something anymore or wanting to change how you're doing it. You know, I love that. Obviously, that's what I'm up to, too. But <laughs> so we have the same mindset. Just one point about the entrepreneurs. I just want to go back a bit. Yeah. Um, we run it as a very, very idealistic business. What do you so mean by that? Yeah. It, uh, we did everything we could to lower the cost of mm. natural and organic foods, mm. made them available to the widest community. Mm. Everybody who worked there got paid the same. And when I left, soon after, the people who, the three of us who owned it, we gave it away to the co-op. So it was, wow. it was entrepreneurial, but it wasn't, um, it was commun community entrepreneurial. Yeah, but that's... Still, I mean, I love it. You know, I love the passion behind it and just, I love it. I love all of it. And it, and it, and again, yeah. like it's, it's very pioneering since there was not very much like that at that time, right? Yeah, that's why we started with two mm -hmm. customers a day. Mm -hmm. so. 
<laughs> you got to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's awesome. So, so then you studied acupuncture. Um, yeah. And then, as you were, I mean, again, pioneering the acupuncture world, you know, because I know, I mean, in the United States, it started to come to the States in the 70s. Was it the same in the UK? Or was it there earlier? Or? Yeah. Um, well, it was earlier. I mean, we just held recently a memorial service for, for Giovanni Machacha. Yeah. So that may, because I presented the story of his life, had to research a bit. So mm. I think he started studying in 71, 72. Mm. That was pretty much the beginning. Mm. I went to school in 75, qualified in 78, but I must emphasize we knew pretty much nothing. I mean, yeah. the state of education was so appalling. Mm -hmm. You know, there were three books in English when I first started wow. studying, and they were rubbish. Wow. But 1978 coincided with the sudden opening up, the first opening up of China. Oh. So one or two people were going over to China study. Giovanni was one of them. Uh -huh. Ted Capture was mm -hmm. one. Coming back. And suddenly this whole um, world of Chinese medicine opened. And then um, Giovanni organized a trip for Western acupuncturists to go mm -hmm. and study in China. Mm -hmm. First time ever that, well, people have been going to learn acupuncture, but first time ever that people who knew some acupuncturists yep. went. And that was a seminal event for me. Um, I was only there three and a half months, but I absorbed like a sponge. I mean, I'd, wow. I'd been I've been practicing for a couple of years, so I, I knew what I didn't know, which was pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah. And I was hungry. Yeah. Really, really hungry. Yeah. That's the difference maybe between what it was like then and what it's like now. If you study Chinese medicine now, you're overwhelmed with information. Mm. You're kind of beating it off. There's just too much. Yeah. We were the opposite. Yeah. There was nothing. We were desperate. We were yeah. really, really hungry. And that's a great state to be in if you really want to learn. Yeah. So that launched a really busy practice for me. Within a few weeks of coming back, I was treating 80 or 90 patients a week um, in multi-bed, you know, because that's, that's how I learned to practice yeah. in China, you know, busy yeah. clinic. And... Um, Giovanni, myself, and two other people, including Julian Scott, the British acupuncturist who really pioneered in the West the treatment of children by acupuncture. We ran postgraduate courses for several years. Wow. Um, and, oh yeah, going back a bit, after I qualified in 78, I didn't have many patients. And I was so used from my days in the food business, being busy mm -hmm. and starting things all the time, I felt a loose end, so I started a journal, mm -hmm. the Journal of Chinese Medicine. And that was partly because there was nothing available. Wow. There was no material. Who, who taught you in, like, school? Like, was it t t Chinese teachers or...? No, no. Who, who was it? In the first two years, it was Brits who had, I would say, the, only the most tenuous understanding. In my final year, it was Giovanni. Wow. And that made an enormous difference. Yeah. I mean, he'd already, he's, because he studied, there was nothing much in English, but he studied French texts. Okay. And then very quickly went to China. So he had stuff to teach. Wow. And, the, you know, the early issues of the journal were like primer textbooks. We had articles on what is wind and yeah. uh, just really, really it. basic stuff because there was nothing available. Did you, do you have that published now in the journal online? Uh, yeah. Awesome. It goes back. Everything, pretty much everything we have published goes, is online. Yeah. That's awesome. Just hundreds of little, little plug, hundreds, thousands of articles. Plug away. Plug away. <laughs> so, plug away. 40, 40, it's our, the journal's 40th anniversary. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So that's a vast, amazing. There's a vast backlog of material. Wow. Really good quality material. Online. Yeah, I mean, and that's so fascinating, too, to learn that it's all the way back from when you were first learning acupuncture, you know, learning from Giovanni, learning from China. I mean, really just starting to understand and translate this medicine over. Like, that's fascinating. 
Yeah. It's history, isn't it? Yeah. To me, it's my life. To you, it's history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Just the other day to me, it's just yesterday. <laughs> you know. But how interesting, or how can you even sum it up, what you've seen happen with Chinese medicine over the last 40 years? You're asking me to sum it up? <laughs> yeah, like, is it mind-blowing? what you've seen change and how it's spread and what's happening now from when you just started where there was nothing, you know? Well, it's not actually, it's very similar to what happened to natural and organic foods. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah. So I can't remember who said it. Somebody said, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been quite lucky. I don't know why that I've, I've what's they call it? an early adopter. Mm. I've kind of seen which way the wind is blowing very early on mm -hmm. and got involved. So my Chinese medicine career, I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. I mean, I forged a really interesting career in a way that's much harder if you came along 10 years later. Yeah. It's a much more crowded field. Yeah. But I was lucky to be there at the beginning. And yeah, it's exploded phenomenally. And mm -hmm. for myself, I mean, I stopped practicing 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I was aware that one thing I was aware of is that the level of knowledge of Chinese medicine was, had grown mm -hmm. so much that, that I was kind of, because I wasn't, I was very busy with them, so many different things. I started to be behind the loop, particularly with herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, um, you know, again, when you, when in the early days, maybe you want to take speciality, start getting into gynecology or something, there's just a couple of textbooks. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. 10 or 20 years later, yeah. there's just so much that you need to know. Mm -hmm. And I spent several years sort of burning burning on all fronts. Mm -hmm. so I was, had, a, had a busy practice. Mm -hmm. I was publishing the journal. Mm -hmm. uh, I was writing a textbook, Manual of Acupuncture. I was teaching all over the world. Wow. And I had a family. Oh, and so I, yeah, after, after the manual was published, um, for, for a number of reasons, including the one I've mentioned, mm -hmm. I'd been practicing for 30 years. I decided it was time to uh, stop practicing. Also, I joined a band. That was, <laughs> quite, that was quite, that was a kind of unfinished, bit of unfinished business for me. And if anybody's been in a band, you know, it's kind of really late night rehearsals and <laughs> long nights on the road coming back from gigs. So it was pretty hard to, to be, to hold a practice together. Yeah. And I was tired. Yeah. Actually, I'd, I'd had enough of practicing. Yeah. And please do share with us what you played in the band. I played the violin in a klezmer band. Amazing. But, you know klezmer? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but klezmer... I saw it online because I saw it on your website, right? There's a little... Okay. Um... So klezmer mm -hmm. was the music of European Jews. Um, and I'm Jewish, but um, klezmer can be quite precious. Our band was the opposite end. We were kind of, nobody else in the band was Jewish. Nobody gave really a toss about precious traditions. We just played this music that went off like a rocket and got people throwing themselves around <laughs> all over the place. And that's what we were, we were a dance band. I love a it. Wild, a wild vodka fueled dance band. So, oh, yeah. I love it, so fun. So then on top of all of that that you were doing, you also knew how to play an instrument. Yeah, well, I played as a kid. Awesome. And I'd stopped. And I think, like, what I realized, and it's a common experience for all of us. We do things, maybe we love them, and then life gets in the way and we drop them. We've got in the back of our mind the idea, I'll do that again someday. Yeah. You know, it's not finished. Yeah. But then you get in life, you get to a certain age, and you realize, well, you know, one day... It's got to be now or it's not going to happen. Yeah. So that was a really, that was what it was really. I love it. Yeah. I love it. All right. So then, so when all this is happening, what was the moment 
where you decided that you're going to write this manual of all these acupuncture points because that is such a huge undertaking and you know i yep. can't even wrap my brain around how you even did that so please share okay well first of all with projects like that yeah same as having a baby <laughs> you don't really know you know you just start it you don't really know <laughs> yeah. how it's gonna take years years to finish and you know be quite such a big thing so I was approached by a publisher, Churchill Livingston, mm -hmm. did I want to write a book on the points? And my first reaction was, hell no, there's loads of points books out there. What could be different? And was there and a then, lot of points books? Because well, I only have grown books. up knowing yours. You know, I... Well, no, there was not, there were lots of points books, there was nothing like that. Yeah. And then actually I had a conversation with my friend Julian Scott, and he said, well, the reason there's lots of points books already is because there's a demand for points books. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's, that's right. So I started to think about it, and I've always loved, I've, I have a passion for gathering information mm -hmm. and then finding a way to share it in a clear way. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, so that started to germinate in my mind, you know, to gather information from, so sorry, I'm going to sort of ramble around a bit, but, you know, the, the Chinese medicine profession, the acupuncture, is pretty new in the West. Mm -hmm. And we, I and my fellow authors, particularly, well, mainly myself and Mazen Al-Khavaji, we thought you can't build a strong house and a weak foundation. Mm -hmm. If you want to develop acupuncture, in this case acupuncture, in the West, what people were doing kind of felt like I was kind of making it up, making it up on the hoof. Mm. Chinese, you know, oh yeah, traditional acupuncture is this, and it, but it wasn't based on anything. It wasn't based on any solid foundation. Mm -hmm. So we, we, what we really wanted to do was to delve into the tradition as much as possible, mm -hmm. draw it together and present it in a way that was, um, it would provide a foundation and be useful to the profession. Mm -hmm. Not saying that this was the only truth about acupuncture, this is the only way to practice acupuncture, but really this was the main, the Chinese medicine historical tradition covering pretty much 2,000 years, mm -hmm from the Nanjing onwards, was the greatest body of written scholarly, practical clinical information we had about Chinese medicine. So that was the, the motive. Mazin um, already spoke very good, read and spoke very good Chinese. He taught himself classical Chinese. So we sat for hundreds and hundreds of hours wow. translating Chinese stuff sort of discussing it um, and then eventually kind of presenting it, kind of summarizing it and presenting it in a way that we felt was um, respectful of the tradition, mm -hmm. not really into, not really adding our own stuff too much. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and then separately from that, I worked with a colleague, a friend, Kevin Baker, who was, well, you know, one of those big guys, not just one brain, but two brains. <laughs> so he, he was the first person in Britain to belong to the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians, which meant wow. he was uh, an A&E surgeon and a GP, came first or second in anatomy in his exams in the United Kingdom. And then he started, took a full-time acupuncture course. Wow. So, yeah, I know. And then he did psychotherapy course. Um, <laughs> So he and I sat for about three years. Again, the same process, delving into the point locations mm -hmm. and the anatomy and, and trying to come up again with our, our best understanding based on all the sources we could access mm -hmm. of where the points were. Wow. So that's the story of the book. And it just went on 
for years and years. How many years? And it, well, it was about eight years, and wow. it was tough. I mean, yeah. I had two, I had two things preying on my mind. The first was my grandfather, a great scholar. Mm -hmm. The last work he embarked on was a, an encyclopedia of law in five languages, and he died before it was finished. Oh. I just left boxes and boxes of notes. So this would kind of come into my mind. Like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to die before this book oh, no. is finished. <laughs> one thing. And, and second thing was that we heard that somebody else was writing a massive points book. Somebody in the States. So the last year of the book, I pretty much stopped practicing for that year. I devoted wow. myself first thing in the morning to last thing at night, writing, working on this book. Wow. And then... I'd wake up in the middle of the night and think, this bastard in America, he's working on the book now, you know, because of the time difference. So I get up. Oh, gosh, that's hilarious. It was like, like I was beat, beaten by the lash. Anyway, it got done. So there you go. But there's, and there's no points book from an American, is there? No, I don't know where we got that story from. Maybe, <laughs> it's like motivation. Maybe, maybe Marzin told me to, to put it. <laughs> A kick, I don't know. So. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's that's obviously in life. Start, yeah. put one foot in front of the other, yeah, and time plus time equals result. It's just, incredible. Just keep going. Yeah, I mean, that is just such a ginormous book, <laughs> so ginormous. Eight years. That's, I mean, it's truly, truly amazing. Is it now, is your book now translated all over the world to other cultures? Um, yeah, it's in about seven or eight languages. So. Wow. That's incredible. But not Chinese. We'd love it to be in Chinese. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe, maybe. Wow. Okay. So, so that's amazing. So that is how that book got written. I mean, you know, when you and I met, like, I had never, like, I honestly had no idea how long ago that book was written. I didn't even know you were <laughs> alive. alive. <laughs> I didn't know. I really didn't. So that was how that book got written. And then 10 years ago, you stopped practicing. And I love now that you've had this passion for the Yangshen. And you've written a new book on the Yangshen, which I love. So, um... So I've explained how, you know, my first entry into the health world was through natural foods. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly the idea that food is a tool mm -hmm. um, to which people can take responsibility for their own health. You know, that health, our health and well-being is not something we're passive experiences of. And whenever it goes wrong, we just put ourselves in the hands of other people to fix, mm -hmm. we can take responsibility and we can do stuff in our own way. So that was already inherent in the, um, the food shop. And incidentally, we pretty soon after we formally established it as a co-op, we set up a charity um, called the Brighton Natural Health Center. Brighton is the city I live in, mm -hmm. which that was in 81 and we started offering classes in um, yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, cookery. Mm -hmm. These were very early days. Awesome. I mean, now you can't turn a corner without finding a <laughs> yoga studio. But it, it wasn't like <laughs> totally. that. So that was already an expansion of, of this idea of um, tools for health. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I carried that over into my understanding of Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. I was very aware that the Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's classic, lays down the idea that um, looking after ourselves is the highest form of medicine. Page one, the sages, mm -hmm. you know, why do people now only live to 50 and are ready to crap it? In the, the mysterious ancient golden days, they live to 100 and fit and healthy. What's the answer? They don't live right. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. So I paused because I you, you froze. Oh. And then soon after that in the Neijing it says 
waiting until a disease has arisen mm. is like starting to dig a well when you're already super thirsty, mm. starting to forge weapons when the battle has begun. So I would say that prevention has always been the very foundation and heart of Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. And then I was very lucky in the 1980s to study with Dr. John Shen, mm -hmm. who at the time was living in New York, came over to the UK. He had a very unique slant on the practice of Chinese medicine. And he told us really certainly that with every patient he had, whatever their complaint, the first question he asked himself was why? Why is this person ill? Why is this person ill in this way? Mm. So instead of just jumping from observation of the disease and differentiation of symptoms and diagnosis into treatment, there was this key step. Uh, what has happened in this person's life that causes them to be ill? Mm. And mm -hmm. the answer to that is very valuable because very often what underlies an illness, well, <clears throat> often what underlies an illness is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Overwork, mm. emotional disharmony, poor diet, yeah. lack of exercise, whatever it is. Yep. Really, without addressing that and without dealing with that, you're going to restrict the possibility of helping the person mm -hmm. get well. Yep. Um, and even when, as is often the case, the cause is in the past and can't be changed, uh, this is information you can give to people that um, enables them to understand and come to terms with and in a way move on from what's caused the illness. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's really important. So I think the, understand, the idea that, you know, put simply, lifestyle is a fundamental part of what we offer in the clinical encounter. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that this is something that we, as inheritors of the Chinese medical tradition and the Yangcheng tradition, particularly this wisdom, mm -hmm. we, we are able to access this wisdom about how to live that's been there as part, it's not just in the medicine. It's not just made up, it's not just, it doesn't just come from Chinese medicine, it comes from Taoism, from Confucianism, some from Buddhism, it comes from folk medicine, comes from martial arts tradition, mm -hmm. all this knowledge and wisdom about this human organism that we inhabit or are, how do you look after it? Where's the workshop manual? So now in a, in a world where everybody's chucking stuff around and fighting, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to, you know, you've got oh, to exercise yeah. until you nearly die. Yeah. Or, you know, you've got to go on raw food diets or paleo diets or whatever it yeah. is. What is so valuable, sort of cutting through this, is this handed on knowledge and wisdom that's based on principles that we really understand as Chinese medicine practitioners. Mm -hmm. The middle way, for example. Mm -hmm. Harmony of yin and yang. Mm -hmm. um, Stopping before completion, not taking anything to its extreme. Mm -hmm. um, I've just had an invitation to play table tennis. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it just came up as a text. So it's okay. Another fun, another thing that I do. Um, and this, this basic, um, you might call it philosophy, really, can make sense of a lot of tangled stuff, and we can't really see, you get so much competing information, and go back to basic principles and probably figure out what's, what's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. so, so that again, so again, my approach to this book was the same really as the approach to the manual. Mm -hmm. Delve, I spent a couple of years, in addition to everything I'd learned to my food days and my practice days, delve into everything I could find. I don't read Chinese, I had to find secondary sources. Mm -hmm. I spent glorious days in the fabulous British Library, which has every book ever published in English, freely available. So I just soaked it all up and 
regurgitated it in my own words, in my own, you know, my own way. And I felt, to be honest, um, I feel at this stage in my life, well, I'm se I was 70 a couple of weeks ago. Wow. But then, I was three years younger, I felt, yeah, you know, I, I sort of beginning to figure things out a bit. <laughs> you know, I've, I've absorbed, you know, because I've always believed in, okay, here's a quick, just a quick deviation. So, mm -hmm. aging. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting book called Aging and Blood Stasis, oh. written a few years ago, Chinese herbal medicine book, okay. by this geriatric specialist who pointed out that aging in Chinese medicine has, has traditionally mainly been un understood as increasing deficiency. Okay. Our uh, gene, uh -huh. our essence declines. Yeah. We decline, mm -hmm. lose essence. Finally, when we run out of essence, we die. Mm -hmm. But it's also very clear that aging is also characterised by stagnation. Mm -hmm. People become stiff, mm -hmm. physically stiff. Mm -hmm. Their body shows signs of blood stasis, dark marks and patches, purple tongue, mm -hmm. and so on. And my observation, particularly, also is that our thinking becomes stiff. Mm -hmm. So, I can't remember why I started this deviation now, but <laughs> what I really wanted, what Perfect. I was really pointing out is um, if we approach life, so I don't want to sound like I'm giving lessons, everybody knows this, but if we approach life on the basis that we're continual learners, mm -hmm. we never fix ourselves, mm -hmm. we don't get stuck. Mm -hmm. We're, we're true scientists, like the Taoists were. The essence of Taoism, Taoist observation that led to the, or contributed to the extraordinary explosion of Chinese science in, from whatever, 200 BCE to 200, 400 post BCE, which, you know, they made so many incredible inventions. It was observe, observe and learn and don't have too many preconceptions. Because when you have preconception, you stop learning. Mm -hmm. When you've got a belief, yeah. I don't care what kind of belief it is, it gets in the way of accurate observation. And so if you're a scientist or if you're a Taoist mm -hmm. in that sense, mm -hmm. you need to be willing to give up fondly held beliefs if new stuff comes along. Mm -hmm. So that to me, you know, I can't say I've by any means entirely succeed, but that's a principle I've followed, tried to follow. And if you do that, you do end up getting getting some wisdom. Yeah, you some wisdom about life. You know, we all do. Yeah. All you need to do is keep learning and live. Yeah. Keep living. Keep living, keep learning. Yeah. Then you end up wise. And stay flexible. Learning stay new flexible. things. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean I I mean again, yeah, I loved your book because even if you think that people know this stuff, you still, you have to hear it over and over. You have to hear it in different ways at different points in your life. It hits you differently, you know? So it's, I mean, all knowledge is regurgitated somehow, you know, but it's just yeah. from a different source, you know? So I, I love it. Is your book, are you aiming to have your book towards the general public also? Well, perhaps a mistake I made when writing the book is I wasn't very clear. It was absolutely for the general public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, maybe it tried to be directed to too many people. So I wanted mm -hmm. it to be useful to practitioners. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be useful to all house practitioners. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to be useful to the general public. Mm -hmm. so any Chinese medicine content, I explained as though people mm -hmm. didn't know it. Yeah. And going back to what you said a moment ago, the best truths are the simple ones that we just keep coming back to and keep again and again going, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I understand that even more, yeah. even better, yeah. even deeper. Um, I, I've been a bit disappointed by the sales of the book, but to tell the truth, after the manual of acupuncture, anything was going to be disappointing. <laughs> right, yeah. And I have thought I should have called it, you know, the hundred secrets of health and happiness or 
some really fuzzy title and mm -hmm. made it much more accessible. And I might got half a mind to do that kind of version. Yeah. Not because I want to make a lot of money, but I do want to spread the word. Yeah. Spread the wisdom. Spread the knowledge of the Chinese Yangshan tradition. Yeah. And um, so just one more plug. It's not a personal plug, Go for really. It. The part of Yangshan, I mean, yeah, I pay a lot of attention to diet. Mm -hmm. It's all, always have. Mm -hmm. Not tightly, though, not strict. I love food. I love cooking international food. Mm -hmm. Just eat good natural foods. Mm -hmm. And wherever possible... For the sake of the planet, we eat organic. Mm. Not, not self-centered. The planet needs organic agriculture. It's probably the biggest single thing that can save the global environment. Mm. Um, so apart from, you know, pay attention to food and blah, 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 the thing that is my passion is Qigong. Yeah. Pra practicing and teaching Qigong. Yeah, that I wanted really to talk about this. My, yeah. yeah. My number one passion at the moment and that's a slightly uphill struggle because I love to teach and I very much want to kind of offer it's such an important part of my life save my life really mm, when did you start you know, it's helped. I started about 30 years ago okay you know I, I, mm -hmm. I feel you know especially with my degenerate past that I talked about yes. and you know not innately robust health you know i've not been blessed with particularly strong constitutional health mm. um i might have been dead by now without mm. it's been a real wonderful part of my life but and it saddens me that um it's not got the buzz yeah you know yeah yeah for every one person who practices qigong ten thousand do yoga yeah because that you can when you can wear fancy yoga clothes and you can go for the burn and yeah. Madonna and the Gwyneth Paltrow do it. And, and it's, I could talk at length about it, but yoga is more familiar to the Western body because modern yoga is largely Western. Yeah. Most it's yoga that people do has got its origins in um, 1920s, 30s, 40s India. And a lot of it was imported from Swedish gymnastics, from various other things. Mm. Very little of modern asana yoga is modern. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's traditional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we get it. We get the stretch. We get, the, you know, Qigong is more alien. Mm -hmm. It's more subtle. Mm -hmm. You have to do it and do it and do it and do it before the flower unfolds. Mm -hmm. And most people want something immediately. They want the buzz. Yep. But it does surprise me, I must say, how few Chinese medicine practitioners practice yep. Qigong because it's the form of body, mind, breath tra training that comes from exactly the same roots yep. as the medicine we practice. I know. Its language is totally familiar to us. Yeah. You know, that's and, why um, I, I chose the acupuncture school that I did, Yosan, which I've connected you with because there's a yeah. Qi program as part of the curriculum. So that was my first introduction to Qigong. And we had to take Thanks it all throughout that. school. Yeah. So yeah. we might as well, you know, we, yeah. Because so you're, we'll, we'll just plug that now. <laughs> so you're going to teach a Qigong course there in October. Yeah? Uh, no, I'm teaching a day on, on my book. Okay. In Yangshan, but it's going to be a morning Qigong session. Now. Okay, cool. Cool. What day is that Some again? Time in, huh. I can't remember. It's like October 20th. October the something. Yeah, 24th, 5th or 6th, something like that. Yeah. Well, you'll be no, there absolutely. and I'll be there too. So everybody watching, it's going to be in LA at Yosan University. Um, so you can look it up at, on Yosan's website. I don't know if they have it listed yet. They might. Um, but that's going to be great. So I'm super excited for that day. But yeah, that it's that's the only acupuncture school that I know of that includes yeah. Qigong in their program. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I'll admit I did not continue the practice after school. Well, look, very few I I bless my parents. 
I do because um, I picked up the violin when I was pretty young because my dad played it and at that time I wanted to do whatever my dad did. Mm -hmm. He played it really badly though because he took it up as a, he took it up as an adult. But um, you know, they're, they're, it, an everyday comment and lots of kids will recognise this is: Have you practiced today? Have you done your practice? You know, you've got a lesson coming up. You've got to practice. Mm -hmm. So this idea that you get up and you practice something it was given to me at an early age, and it mm -hmm. stood me in fantastic stead. I've always practiced something. Yeah, I did yoga, tai chi, qigong. When I was in the band, I practiced the violin every morning. Mm -hmm. It's just part. It's like breathing. Mm -hmm. So it's so lucky, and unfortunately, many people don't have that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I naively present my qigong classes as here learn this go away and practice it mm. but very few people do. <laughs> they come to the class but they don't do the practice never mind <laughs> i am an enormous fan of what has incorrectly been called tcm mm. that means china's medicine yeah um and one of the reasons I love it is because it um, practices differentiation of patterns. Uh -huh. And differentiation of patterns, it, the way it's developed in Chinese medicine, I think it's probably unique in the world. And one of the smartest, wisest ways of practicing medicine. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's a step in between looking at symptoms and deciding treatment. Mm -hmm. So in Chinese medicine, you have different layers of differentiation of patterns. Um, for example, perhaps the first one learns is an acupuncturist is differentiation of patterns according to the channels. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. Which channels are involved? Which channels am I going to treat? Mm -hmm. Then you also learn differentiation of patterns according to eight principles, qi blood, body fluids, uh, zhang fu, um, fevers, and so on. Uh, I, apart from a kind of anti-TCM trend that there's no time to talk about at the moment, but I have a lot of thoughts about that, um, I see a trend in acupuncture for um, moving, of, of staying at the level of differentiation of patterns according to channels. Mm. A lot of very popular forms of acupuncture are playing the channel. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tan method. Mm -hmm. I don't even know them actually, maybe Tong acupuncture mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. It's all about points and channels. And that's great when it comes to technique. And clearly, it's often very effective. Mm -hmm. But I believe our medicine it goes much deeper than that. So I believe our medicine, as I said, through differentiation of patterns, we start to understand causes. Mm -hmm. And when we understand causes, we start to understand deeply, or we have a tool to deeply understand this patient in front of us in the context of their disease and their life and who they are. Yeah. No, I'm not being mystical. No, no, no. That, I don't think yeah. that's mystical Somebody at all. Practicing. Yeah. Somebody has a lot of cheese stagnation. That tells you lots, a lot about them and their life. Totally. Somebody has yin deficiency. Yeah. That tells you something. There's they have done, nothing done mystical years. about our medicine, I don't no. think. So you can't, you cannot fully practice the medicine without fully, deeply, richly, without really working with differentiation of patterns. Yeah. And I, um, I wonder sometimes whether that in its fullest sense is despairing a bit because it's not, differential patterns is not just to determine treatment. So differentiation of patterns, as I learned when I was in China in 1981, points forwards towards the treatment, but backwards towards the cause. Mm. And the backwards bit towards the cause is the really uh, is a an equally important thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was it. <laughs> that was my spiel. <laughs> I love it. I've finished. <laughs> I've finished. Well, I love it. Do you have time to take a couple questions? Yeah, quick, quick. Oh, and somebody just said they bought your book in the comments. Oh, good. 
That's <laughs> good. It's great. And book. by the way, yeah. by the way, if you have my book and if you like it, stick a review on Amazon. Yeah, that's true. It's oh, really I'll, nice. I'll do that too. I haven't done yeah. that yet. Yeah. yeah. And and so so we have your book. We have your class coming up in LA. And then you're also teaching at the PCOM symposium also. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. an afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Summer. So that's where you can um, connect with Peter. And then let's see. So, oh, I had someone ask me to ask you if you believed in ghost points. Believe in them. That's what they asked. Yeah. <laughs> well, ghost points, since some years, 13 ghost points are traditionally that's a category of points. Yeah. Believing them is a believing them is an open question. Presumably the question is do they treat ghosts? <laughs> so I don't believe in ghosts. <laughs> but they treat in modern terms we say they treat certain mental disorders, delusions, maybe schizophrenia, you know, they yeah. contribute. That would be that would be my understanding of them. The modern application of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody's asking, how do you feel about Mikio Senki and esoteric acupuncture? I've never heard of that. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So, <laughs> it's just another, I don't, another way of I, treating. I'm pretty allergic to the word esoteric, I have to say. It, are you? Yeah. I think, you know, I tend to think, I tend to think that the good stuff is simple. I totally There's, agree. I, here's, yeah. here's, um, here's, here's, there was a doctor called Fei Bo Xiong, 19th century famous Chinese herbalist. Volker Scheid has written about him. Mm -hmm. He said, if I remember correctly, there's nothing miraculous in the world, mm -hmm. only the ordinary. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the perfection of the ordinary is miraculous. Mm, I love it. I, I nail my colors to that mask. Yeah, so I love it. I, you know, I've used the phrase, don't go down the garden looking for the fairies at the end of the garden. Realize the miracles that are there every step of the way. Oh, that's just so beautiful. What's, just what's happening is all a miracle. Yeah. You, don't have to look, you don't have to look for the weird miracle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I the love growing it. of plants, the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the manifestations of the Tao, mm -hmm. the 10,000 mm -hmm. things. The miracle of the 10,000 things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's so true. Oh, I love it. Uh, Stephen said that you did a lecture at his college once and you cooked some stir fry vegetables with a little water and lemon. <laughs> little cold. Well, I remember that. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, okay, somebody's asking, what's the name of your new book? What's the title? Live Well, Live Long, Teachings from the Chinese Nourishment of Life Tradition. Wonderful. They say they'll go buy it. Right. Um, okay, let's that see. That makes seven people who bought it. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, all right, let's see. Someone says, let's talk about Qigong and how it helps trauma. And they said, three cheers for our practitioners who do community acupuncture and trauma medicine. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that might be a reference to the fact there's been a lot of research, actually mainly on from the yoga world, but it mm -hmm. applies very much to Qigong, mm -hmm. how um, slow, deep, and from the Qigong point of view, lower abdominal breathing has yeah. an incredible cascade mm. of emotional, psychological, and physical, physiological benefits. Yeah, yeah. You can reset... Oh, yeah, you wrote an article on that, actually. I saw I your article. Yeah. yeah, on the journal again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. You know, that too, I'm not sure if it is over in the UK, but in the United States, that's something that's kind of becoming a bit of a fad is the breath breathing. work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Mm -hmm. as, long as, it's, as long as it's sensible and down to earth. And... So far, it yeah. seems like it, you know, because there's not yeah. really too much kookiness you can do with it. Well, but who knows? Oh, we'll see. Yeah, 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 I should say can, that. I'm sure we can figure something out, you know. <laughs> All right, let's see. There's just one more question. What's your experience treating depression via TCM? I think there's a real limit we have to recognize to what 
um, any medicine mm. can offer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for these disorders. Mm -hmm. And there are, they need work. Mm. You know, they need people to do some kind of work on themselves. Mm. It's part, mm -hmm. part of getting through it. Um, and that work, we know, we know. It's not just us. I mean, exercise, for example. Mm -hmm. Exercise is as, as effective as medication for moderate depression. Totally. You know. Yep. Um, diet can play an important role. Mm -hmm. you know, as well as, of course, psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. The right kind of therapy. So um, we can play an important part. But I think it's probably naive to think that we can exceed the limits of medicine. Mm, interesting. Just because it's just because it's Chinese medicine doesn't make it magic. It's still subject to the same fundamental rules of life as any other medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my yeah. So and so then, do you have the mindset of integrating the medicines? Um. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm just. I'm part of a team at the moment that's been working for a few years on another big textbook, oh. which is treatment of infertility. Oh, well, love it. Basically, basic um, regulating the period is half the book. Yep. The other half is treatment of infertility. But the principal author is Professor Susan Wu, or Yuning Wu, in China, who is probably... China's top specialist in integrated Western and Chinese medicine. Wow. So, yeah, I very much believe in integrated medicine. Wow. I also believe as ex, up to a point, I believe as ex Chinese Premier Ding Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> time we need this and sometimes we need that. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely really? totally agree. I, I mean, I, I would like more realism mm. to be part of Chinese medicine education. Mm -hmm. We suffer mm -hmm. from this problem, and I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. Teachers fall in love with the act of teaching Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful edifice. We love it so much that we can end up giving the impression that it can do everything. Yeah. That's, A, it's not true. Mm. It's simply not true. The Chinese say medicine can only cure curable diseases and then not always. Mm. Um, but it's a burden on young practitioners mm. because instead of being thrilled by the realistic results they get, they feel undermined by their failure to attain mostly unattainable results they've been led to expect. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the work-a-day practitioner will help a lot of people to varying degrees, mm -hmm. cure a very small number if it's a chronic disease, mm -hmm. um, and that's a wonderful service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, acupuncture can benefit migraine headache or migraine headache by a factor of about 50%. So much. As, mm -hmm. as good as or better than any other medicine. Yeah, absolutely. But if you're expect, expecting to cure everybody, you're going to feel like a failure. So yeah. realistic expectations, I feel, is really important. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And, you know, so of course, so many of my followers struggle with that because they're new practitioners, you know, and, and they have so much uh, challenge with their confidence, with the patients, you know, and I think that you made such a wise point you know, that it's, it's not exactly taught to us that way in school. And we get out really not knowing what to expect and have trouble with our cases. And then, you know, that's so discouraging to new practitioners, you know, and it's just this, you know, spiral down of then having trouble with their practice and everything, you know, so I think. And we don't, and we don't, we don't have um, a reliable system for um, mentoring. You know, yeah. a GP yeah. who a GP who knows way more about medicine. All right, it's Western medicine, but it's still medicine. Yeah. A GP who knows way more about medicine 
having studied for seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. Do you know what a GP is? Do you use Yeah, yeah, term? general practitioner, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we'll still, you know, we'll have um, supervision yeah. and mentoring and have people they yeah. can turn to. We get chucked out really under-trained, yeah. very inexperienced. Yeah. We get thrown in the deep end. Yeah. And we have to call on our own resources. And sometimes those resources... Sometimes we're really challenged and yeah. we feel insecure mm -hmm. and inadequate mm -hmm. and maybe give up. Mm -hmm. It's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's really a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah, I know. You know, so I, I so appreciate you sharing that, you know, with all of your wisdom and experience in Chinese medicine, sharing that fact is so powerful for everyone to hear because that is yeah. exactly a big challenge right now. And there is another, there's a practice one can do, mm -hmm. oh. which is simply, when we encounter what we don't know, what we feel ignorant about, the best response to cultivate is curiosity. Yes. I don't know that. How interesting. Yes. Let me find out. Let me watch. Let me observe. Instead of which, especially as young practitioners, we encounter something we don't know and they go, mea culpa. Yeah, and instantly I'm judge dumb. ourselves. I should yeah. know this. Yeah, exactly. I'm crap. Exactly. That's exactly. And then you don't, and then you don't learn. Also. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. This is, this is, yes, you're talking my language. <laughs> you know, this is such I a know, huge thing. What you're doing, what you're doing is helping. Thank you. You know, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm constantly teaching the mindset part of it, you know, because it is, it's just our judgment of ourselves that gets in our way of a successful practice. I mean, anybody new in any medicine anywhere struggles with the same things that we do as acupuncturists, but we're so hard on ourselves as and a so profession. Isolated. And what? And so isolated. Yes, exactly. And also, yes. Also, here's, so when I wrote, I, I, I'm sure we need to, I'm sure people are getting sick of this. Hey. But, Whatever, um, we can chat. <laughs> we still have a big book. audience on. It's, oh. grow, it's growing. They're fine. People, people right, are loving it. My book. They're giving us comments. I learned, I learned a lot writing my book. The thing, the area I learned most was the field of, of the emotions. Yeah. And Chinese medicine says that excess of any of the emotions, they listed seven, but we could expand it into 30. You know, there's lots not there. There's no shame, for example. There's no hatred. There's, there's lots of things. There's no jealousy. Yeah. So excess of any of those emotions is harmful to us. Yeah. And one of the interesting things is if we, we or, or another person experience a blatantly obvious emotion like a fit of rage, that's very clear cut. But a lot of us have these emotions eating away at us. Yes. Yeah so constantly that often we're not even aware of them. Yes, yes. Right, so for example, you were talking about yes. self-criticism. Yes. Yeah. Or fear. Yeah. I mean, not big fear. You know, if you know you're constantly afraid of germs, that's something you can know about. But mild fears, you know, fear of being judged, fear of people laughing, maybe fear of, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, you're not wearing the right clothes or mm -hmm. your friends don't really like you. All these kind of things... Now they, in the young Chinese tradition, they eat away at our mm -hmm. energy. So the first thing, the first challenge is to become, is to really become aware of it. Yes. So this, for example, in this particular subject we're talking about, self-criticism and self-doubt, we become so used to it, we take it for granted. We don't even see it. Yep. The first thing is to become aware of it. And that's where the practice mm -hmm. of either meditation mm -hmm. or qigong mm -hmm. comes in because by mm -hmm. stilling the mind and, and starting to kind of dissociate, detach ourselves a little bit from this flow of emotions, we start to be able to see them. Yeah. Get a bit more distance. Yeah, I so am with you on that. That's, that meditation, Vipassana meditation, is what started me to be able to finally distance myself and see myself from that and that is a lot of what i bring into my coaching now is my ability to see people's blind spots 
and help them to uncover them, you know, to be aware of what's stopping them and getting in the way of their success. Because, you know, I just made a post the other day that like that nothing changes between you being a struggling practitioner to you being a successful, successful practitioner other than your mindset. You know, that is... Well, and your experience, and oh, yeah. your clinical experience, because that's really important. In medicine, clinical experience is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest factors. Yes. And that's where our training lets us down often. We don't get enough clinical experience. Yeah, yeah. Imagine being, you're being you're, imagine studying medicine, you get chucked into the A&E department for six months, you get chucked into the gynecology department, yeah. you get chucked into the pediatrics yeah. department. Yeah. You get loads of yeah. experience before yeah. you go out on your own. Yeah, and that and helps you, your you confidence. Very yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think, our, I mean, I am so grateful for our Chinese medicine schools, but I do believe that we could use a whole overhaul on them and a more efficient and effective way to train our practitioners now. Hopefully dinner is ready for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think actually what's happened is, uh, I think I mentioned I'm going to a festival tomorrow, so oh, yes. friends come around with the van, I've got to load up, so I'm oh, going to have okay. to. Okay, that's fine. Reluctantly, because it's been an enjoyable chat. Totally, yes. And as you can probably tell, I could talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and thing. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, it would be well, so fun to do this again sometime. You know, it's been yeah. like such a pleasure. We could get on here and chat about anything, you know, and, and dive sure. into anything that you want to just share more because you, Peter, have like so much priceless knowledge that really no one else has because of your experience. Well, be just because of who you are. And your experience and you going to China and you, you know, learning from Machiocho. I mean, like, like I said, you are the pioneer of our profession. Nobody else oh, is you. Well, yeah. Well, that's one true. Of them. Nobody else is you. I'm no. one of the pioneers. Yes, one of them. One and of that, them. Was, that was 50% luck and timing. Timing. I don't luck. think so. It's not luck. I don't believe okay. in luck. You were the chosen one. <laughs> right. right. You see the... <laughs> Can you see it? I can see it. It's light. It's halo. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> All right. Well, then, uh, again, you know, um, get your book. Tell us the title again, please. Live well, live long. And that live well means be well yeah. and live in, a good, live in a good way. Yeah. Don't be, don't be a dick. <laughs> live well, don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah. Live well, live long. Teachings from the Chinese nourishment of life tradition. Okay. But I haven't said hello to whoever's watching. I forgot to say that. So yeah. I'll say goodbye. Goodbye now to whoever's watching.